consistency conditions. All right? So this is still in the responsible part of the development of the subject. We'll soon be getting irresponsible. Don't, don't worry. The, all the fun is when you're irresponsible. But you have, to, you have to be responsible enough to know you're having fun when you're irresponsible, um, other than just being a crackpot. All right, so uh, let me uh, summarize uh, what we were doing uh, last time quickly. So um, last time we emphasized that uh, the amplitudes are not Lorentz tensors. Um, they're objects that transform when you do a Lorentz transformation on the momenta uh, by picking up uh, an action of the little group. the massless particles of elicity H. This needs to satisfy that if you rescale lambda and lambda tilde, you pick up uh, a factor of Ta to the negative 2HA m of lambda and lambda tilde and H. So that, as we illustrated, you can even read off what the helicities are just from the homogeneities under this transformation. Okay? So amplitudes are, are, Lorentz invari are functions of the Lorentz invariance, and as we said, the uh, Lorentz invariants here are things like lambda 1, lambda 2, and lambda tilde 1, lambda tilde 2, just uh, contracting with the epsilon symbol. So that's what amplitudes are. Uh, amplitudes are functions of these two different kinds of brackets, lambda and lambda tilde, of some fixed homogeneity under rescaling. OK, so that's just, we've taken care of the kinematics. And that's already a big deal for the reason I emphasized last time, because in ordinary treatments of quantum field theory, you never get to see an actual amplitude. You see these. Lorentz tensors that are dotted into polarization vectors, but those polarization vectors are gauge redundant objects. You have to talk about whole equivalences cl uh, classes of them, and that's why you never actually see what the amplitude really looks like. These are the variables where you see what the amplitude really looks like. And then we discovered that three particle kinematics is extremely constraining, that either we have a situation where uh, in the three particles, lambda 1 tilde is parallel to lambda 2 tilde is parallel to lambda 3 tilde, or the other way around. That's called the black vertex, or the other way around, uh, where lambda 1 is parallel to lambda 2 is parallel to lambda 3. And so that allowed us to completely determine, if you give me uh, three particle scattering with helicities h1 and h2 and h3, that this amplitude is equal to, up to some overall strength of the coupling, 1, 2 to the negative h1, negative h2 plus h3 or some g tilde times the other way around. And the top formula is valid when h1 plus h2 plus h3 is negative, and this formula is valid when h1 plus h2 plus h3 is positive. And uh, as I mentioned, the special case where h1 plus h2 plus h3 is 0 is a little bit degenerate, and, but only for the most boring case of a scalar particle where the h's are 0 and the amplitude is a constant do those theories end up making sense. Um, at the level of kinematics, you can write this down. Um, but uh, there will be inconsistencies which are, you can actually check for yourself after the exercises of today why, why those, those critical cases are actually uh, thrown out. Okay, and again, this configuration would be the black one where all the lambda tildes are parallel, and this one would only be non zero when all the lambdas are parallel. Okay? All right. So, those are the three particle amplitudes. And now what we're going to do today, and that's all kinematics. And you'll notice that I can write down these three particle amplitudes for any old spin, spin 17, 99 million, it doesn't matter. But now we're going to impose a physical uh, consistency condition of um, called the four particle test 
where we're going to put in locality and unitarity to fix uh, allowed theories, allowed consistent theories. And so let me say what the And here is where, if you have a little bit of uh, knowledge of quantum field theory ahead of time, what I'm saying is obvious. If you don't, you have to take, this is the one place you have to take one fact on faith. Um, it's a very plausible sounding fact, we have to take it on faith. As I said, put it in a black box, and when you take a proper quantum field theory course, open up that black box and you understand where it comes from, but the rest was going to follow um, uh, just uh, uh, believing the simple statement. But let me say what the setup is. So, we're going to imagine that we're working in some approximation where these particles are weakly coupled. Okay? And so uh, we're, we're going to be working in an approximation where if there was an underlying Lagrangian, we're imagining that we're calculating tree amplitude. Now, when you're calculating tree amplitude, if you know something about quantum field theory and Feynman rules, you know, what do you get? Let's just do something sort of very simple. Imagine you're calculating the, the, the Feynman rule for uh, something like that. There would be some incoming momenta P1 and P2, and this intermediate line would have momentum P1 plus P2. And Feynman tells you there's a Feynman propagator, and uh, you would write down associated with this diagram a factor 1 over P1 plus P2 squared. Okay, in fact, that would just be the full answer for this particular Feynman diagram. Okay. But what we're going to abstract away from this more generally, now you might have much more complicated things, polarization vectors, other stuff going on. That's all going to give you some things in the numerator, but there's a piece that involves a propagation in space-time. Then back in position space always gives you a factor of 1 over p squared. And it's just a single power of p squared. It's not 1 over p squared squared. It's not some more complicated function. It's just a simple pole in p squared. Okay. Now that fact that what you get is a simple pole in p squared is the momentum space avatar of locality and position space. Right? It says that the amplitude blows up back in position space when two points are separated by something that can be connected by propagation in space-time. Right? So that's the only thing that we need to take from standard quantum field theory here, is that the amplitudes can have poles, but the poles occur when some internal momentum goes on shell. Okay, so some p1 plus p2 squared goes zero, and the pole is a simple pole, just one over p squared. All right, well, something else which is obvious from the picture is that if I sit on that pole, what is the residue on that pole? Um, uh, uh, the amplitude as p1 plus p2 squared goes to zero goes like one over p1 plus p2 squared. That's the pole. But I should be able to interpret uh, what's going on right in that neighborhood as this particle that was a virtual particle is now real. So this amplitude should be, again, roughly speaking, the product of an amplitude to produce this intermediate particle times the, the, then it propagates a long way. That's what the 1 over p1 plus p2 squared is. But then on the other side, uh, there's the amplitude for 3 goes to 4. Is this clear now here? Because in this picture, i is on shell. Okay? It's no longer virtual. So we're saying that we know something about the amplitude. We know the, no, no matter what's going on, we know that it, it, it can at most have simple poles, and uh, if the residue of that simple pole has got to be expressed as a product over three particle amplitudes. And, uh, uh, and it's a sum over everything that can be exchanged between the uh, two sides. Okay? So this is good news because the residue now is completely determined by three particle amplitudes that we've already fixed on general ground. So this is shortly going to turn into an algebraic problem. Okay, so what is our algebraic problem? Our algebraic problem is that we, have a, we now want a function of four momenta, and, but we want it to have the property that it, it, it can have, maybe it doesn't have any poles at all. Uh, it doesn't have any poles at all, that's fine. It could just be a polynomial. Okay? Um, but then, uh, but then uh, there's no underlying three-particle amplitude there. Okay? If there is an underlying three-particle amplitude, the four-particle amplitude must have a pole. And, but it has to have the property that the residue of the pole is given by the product of two three-particle amplitudes. So, we just, so that's our game. We want to find a function of four momenta, p1, p2, p3, p4, with poles when p1 plus p2 squared goes to zero, p1 plus p3 squared goes to zero, p2 plus p3 squared goes to zero, such that when you sit on any one of those poles, the residue is the product of the three-particle amplitudes on, 
on, on, uh, uh, for the channels on, uh, on the opposite side. OK? Yes? Is there proof for this outside of the Quran? Uh, so, um, uh, uh, no, okay? Um, but also it has nothing to do with Lagrangian quantum field theory. So what it, it doesn't have so much to do with uh, Lagrangians. Um, uh, you can ask, uh, I'm, I seem to be doing something, I seem to be speaking out of both sides of my mouth. On the one hand, I say, screw Lagrangians. On the other hand, I say tree level. So what is going on? And the answer is that um, uh, I emphasize in the very first lecture that we do not know as a God-given fact of life what the analytic properties of scattering amplitudes actually are that encode causality, blah, blah, blah. However, uh, uh, the invariant sense of what we mean by perturbation theory in terms of Lagrangians is that as you go to higher and higher orders in, uh, in perturbation theory, it's not even orders in G, it's in the loop expansion, you get more and more complicated analytic functions. So at lowest order, at lowest order at all, if you don't have anything, you just have contact terms, you just get a polynomial in the momenta. Then maybe you have contact terms. Uh, so maybe, maybe you have uh, th uh, three particle amplitudes like this. So you can exchange the particles. Then you can have poles. Then when you go to loop order, you can start having branch cuts. And now the analytic structure gets much more interesting and, and complicated. But at least at tree level, uh, the, sorry, what tree level means is that there is an approximation where we can think about the amplitudes where they only have poles. OK? And sort of uh, uh, beyond that, saying a non-perturbative statement and so on, we're so far from being able to say anything like that. We're not even going to talk about it. Okay? Um, Sorry. Yeah. It wasn't a simple pole. A double pole also is not interpreted. Uh, uh, a, a double pole you can think of as two simple poles uh, just uh, coming very close together. And so you have the wrong sign residue. So, so the sum of the residues would, would, would be zero. And that would correspond to having uh, to having uh, a wrong sign propagator, having a ghost. Okay? So here, what, what, what is important is we just have a, a simple pole, and the fact that you get the product of two three-particle amplitudes on both sides also gives some positivity to the coefficient. The coefficient is the square of something, and that's it either with a, with a positive sign. If you had a theory that had one over p to the fourth in it, then you could not give it in normal 3-1 signature and so on, you could not give it a unitary quantum mechanical interpretation with positive probability. Okay? So we could spend a long time talking just at this general level about, uh, about, uh, about uh, these things. But what I want to do in this class, and we'll get to it at some point. In fact, we'll have a whole couple of lectures about uh, exactly what we know about the analytic properties of scattering amplitudes. Um, but here, I want to, I want to sort of cut to the jump, cut, cut to the chase. Take this as a very, very plausible statement and see uh, how the very simple, how uh, compatibility with locality and unitarity turns into a very sharp algebraic statement that then tells us what theories are consistent and what, and what theories are not. All right, so let me begin. Uh, so let me just uh, uh, remind again, we're going to be using these variables all the time. So S is going to be P1 plus P2 squared. T is going to be P2 plus P3 squared u will be p1 plus p3 squared. And if you're going to draw sort of channels for these things, um, s would look something like this, 1, 2, 3, 4. You see that propagator there looks like p1 plus p2 squared. And then uh, t would be something like this. If I still labeled them 1, 2, 3, 4, like p2 plus p3 squared would go in there. And u would be something that crosses like that, right? Is that clear? Okay, so those are sort of three channels. Uh, where, the, where the propagator involved is either S or T or U. Okay, yes? Um, just a question about on this locality. Um, in theory, it's like if you have like a string theory S matrix or a theory of quantum gravity, yep. um, in what sense does that obey locality as you're describing? Yeah, so uh, um, uh, we'll get, again, we'll get to this when we talk about the analytic properties of amplitudes on totally general grounds, but let me just tell you the right answer. String theory is even more constrained than quantum field theory, not less. It satisfies exactly the same locality rules and more. It's more constrained. So uh, as far as locality as measured by, as seen by the S matrix, it satisfies all the things we're seeing in field theory and more. But this okay? doesn't capture so, the notion of locality that string theory maybe doesn't. No, so. that, 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 that notion of locality has to do with a much more subtle thing. We'll, we'll get to this uh, around halfway through the course. Okay, so, but that has to do with the high energy, uh, the, the high energy behavior of the amplitude at fixed angle. Okay, in quantum field theory, it has to die as a power. In a local theory, it has to be bounded exponentially by, uh, it, it can't die faster than exponentially in energy. And ultimately, in the theory of gravity, it dies faster 
than that because of black hole production and things like that. So there is a specific sense in which in a gravitational theory, some notion of locality is uh, violated, but not these ones. Okay? These, are, these are not only satisfied, they're, after all, the string theory was discovered in the S-matrix program by exactly satisfying these, these rules. Okay? Um, you should never get the idea that there are sort of dumb exceptions to things. Everything gets more constrained. When, when some new interesting structure comes up in physics, things get more constrained, not less constrained than, than they were before. Okay, now, so let's see how this works already in the stupidest example of phi cube theory. Okay, so here it's sort of pretty obvious what, what, what we're doing. So, so uh, let's say I just have a scalar theory. So here the spin is zero. And so this coupling constant, let me call it G. And so what am I trying to do? I'm trying to build a function um, which uh, has a certain residues as S and T and U go to zero. So let's compute. So the first thing we should do is say, what is the residue as S goes to zero? So not just the residue as S goes to zero is, well, it's just given by this times that. So that's just G squared, easy peasy, okay? And similarly, the residue in T and U, all of these residues as S or T or U go to zero are given by G squared. So if someone says, G give me a function of S, T, and U, what has poles in S, T, and U, and the residues on each one of those poles is G squared, then what is, what is, what is a function that does that? Well, so the amplitude could be G squared, 1 over S, plus 1 over T, plus 1 over U. Okay, and, and notice that I don't, that, uh, this argument doesn't tell me this is the whole amplitude. I can add to this any polynomial in S, T, and U. I know nothing about these things. Right? They might be there and so on. All I know is if there is a cubic coupling, this is what the amplitude can look like. Right? It has to have this piece that has these poles, and I've correctly guessed what, uh, uh, well, I, uh, I can determine the amplitude has got to look like that. If I want to say more, if I know something about the high energy theory, if I know the high energy theory is such that the amplitudes don't blow up or something like that, then I can throw out this polynomial piece too. Okay, and then, and then I'm restricted to that. And notice that this goes one to one, if you care about Lagrangians, this goes one to one with what you know about Lagrangians. Um, if I give you a three point amplitude, that tells you the Lagrangian has some phi cube coupling. Maybe there's a phi to the fourth coupling too. Maybe there's a phi to the tenth too. Okay, so if you want to know what the amplitude is for the full theory, there's a piece that is associated with the phi cube coupling, and there's all kinds of other th pieces that you can't compute. And here we precisely see that. The piece that's forced on you by the phi cube coupling is this piece with the poles. There may be other pieces there. And when you make the decision that you're talking about phi cube theory, you're making the decision that the high energy amplitudes aren't blowing up. Uh, and so you're only talking about the piece that's associated with the phi cube coupling. In which case, I would throw these things out. I would throw out these contact terms and only stick with this piece. Okay, but what we logically know is just that it has this form. Okay? All right, so this, this is very, very easy. Um, so let's repeat the strategy for a slightly less familiar theory. Uh, I mean, a, a, a theory that you haven't seen the amplitudes in this language before. Let's do Yukawa theory. All right, so now if I have a uh, Yukawa theory, I have a, this is a case where I have a massless scalar, so it has spin zero. And remember, the amplitude we're talking about is with two minus helicities. So if this is particle three and this is one and two, then, uh, then uh, these are fermions. So they have uh, helicity minus a half and helicity minus a half. Then this three particle amplitude is some coupling constant. Let's call it y times one, two. Angle bracket one, two. OK, and, and maybe the other one for plus helicity would be some y tilde times square bracket 1, 2. OK, so it's kind of clear that this has a correct helicity weight, so you don't have to plug into our general formula. Of course, you could, but it's very easy to check that it has the correct helicity weights. All right. But you see, now it's also guaranteed to work. Everything is guaranteed to work because let's do the same strategy. Now I want to calculate, let's say, the four particle amplitude for two scalars and two fermions. Okay? So in order to do that, so I'm interested in an amplitude that looks like this. Okay? Two scalars and two fermions. Let me call them one, two, three, four. And let me put the helicities here. Um, uh, you can go away uh, yourself and calculate the other helicities. Most of them will be zero. So I'm only talking about the ones that are going to end up being not, not non-zero. So let's say I want to look at this amplitude. Let's look at the residue in the S channel. Okay? What is the residue that I can have in the, uh, in the S channel? Well, if that's the only interaction that I can have, the residue in the S channel 
is equal to um, this guy, right? It's this amplitude times that one. OK? So this is a little more interesting. I have 1, 2, and I have some intermediate guy, i and i, and 3, 4, 1 minus 4 plus. So what is this residue? Well, uh, this, is th this, this product is equal to this amplitude, so that's y times 1i, where this, remember, i is now a massless particle, right? So i has its own spinner helicity variable, lambda i, lambda tilde i. Okay, so on this side, I have 1i. On the other side, I'm going to have y tilde bracket 4i. Okay? Ah, sorry, and I, I should say something. Uh, here, i is negative helicity on this leg, but here, i is positive helicity on the other leg. Now, how do I know that? So when this intermediate line has helicity, you have to sum over everything that can, that can flow, but the helicities on the opposite sides of the line must be opposite each other. That's clear physically, because you want to imagine that you're producing a particle and that it's propagating from here to there. Okay, so if you're producing it with some helicity here, it's the same helicity, but it's an incoming state on the other side, but we're, but we're by convention, representing all the lines as, as outgoing. Okay, so physically, it's obvious that the, the helicity uh, out here is treated as incoming on the other side, and so I have to flip, flip the sign. Mathematically, it's even more obvious, because uh, whatever this product is that we're talking about, it doesn't know anything about i, and therefore it should carry no helicity weight for i. Okay, so anything I do has to involve the opposite helicities uh, for i on one side and the other, so that the final object carries vanishing helicity weight in i. Okay. So this is a so th so this is a sort of a general a general fact uh, that that whenever we factorize these amplitudes, I have some intermediate line here. And I have a helicity h, and I have a helicity negative h here. And I have to sort of sum over everything that can appear uh, on i, and also sum over, the, uh, sum over the possible helicities, but with this choice, where the helicity on this leg is opposite to the helicity on that leg. So, so whatever is going on here on, on the outside, the residue in the s channel, so for a totally random amplitude, the residue in the S channel looks something like that. Exchanging something in the S channel, um, we might have many particle species, in which case we'd sum over every one that could be there, but the helicities are, are, are treated in this way, that they're, they're opposite on both sides. All right, so now let's start this formula. So this is y, y tilde times 1, uh, 1 i, i4. OK, and so. That's pretty nice, because notice here that we're getting lambda, lambda tilde for i. Okay, So that's just the momentum of i, of particle i. Okay, So I can rewrite this expression as 1, the momentum of the intermediate line, times 4. But what is the momentum of the intermediate line? pi is, for example, p1 plus p2 which is also negative p3, negative p4 by momentum conservation. So I can express this in a way that i no longer makes any appearance. It's just given in terms of the data, 1, 2, 3, 4. So let's see it. For example, I could use this formula and shove it in there. What do I get if I look at, what, what if I get if I look at 1, p1 plus p2, 4? What is p1 times 1? That's 0, right? Because this is, if I'm very explicit, this is lambda 1 alpha. Then p1 would be lambda 1 with an upstairs uh, alpha, lambda tilde 1 alpha dot plus lambda 2 alpha, lambda 2 tilde alpha dot. And then downstairs, I'd have a lambda tilde 4 alpha dot. <laughs> Okay, so that's explicitly what, what, what we have, the only way we can contract these alpha alpha dot indices. But lambda 1, lambda 1 is 0, okay? because it's the same thing contracted with itself with the epsilon symbol. Okay, so what I'm left with is therefore just lambda 1 contracted with lambda 2. And what is this expression? This is just 1, 2 times 2, 4. Okay? So that's a, something we're going to use over and over again. Every time you see i on the inside at, at four particles, you can just 
So 1 pi 4 is the same as 1, 2, 2, 4. Or I could also write it as negative 1, 3, 3, 4. If I wanted to write it in a more symmetrical looking way, I could write it as p1 minus p3 between 2 and 4. They're all equal to each other. Okay? So, but just, just for fun, uh, let's, let's, write, let's write this in a more uh, symmetrical way that 1 pi 4 is equal to 1 p2 minus p3. I'm ignoring factors of 2. Okay? Uh, 4. Okay? So that's great. We learn what the residue is in the S channel. And therefore, now we again have the same game. We have to build a rational function of all these variables such that they have a pole when S goes to 0, also a pole where U goes to 0 because I can attach a scalar lines uh, on the other side with this residue. But well, that's easy to do. We just computed the residue, so we just divide by S, and I do the same thing, divide by U. So this amplitude, 1 minus 2, 3, 4 plus, is equal to 1 uh, P2 minus P3, 4 over S plus <coughs> um, uh, interchanging 2 and 3. So 1 let's say p3 minus p2 4 over u and some y y tilde in front of the whole thing okay so congratulations we've now computed our first slightly non-trivial uh, scattering amplitude not scalars it's like Compton scattering involving vial fermions but if any of you have taken a field theory course you'll be happy that there is no gammas there's no slashes there's no u bars and v's you don't have to freak out that you're dealing with vial spinners there's no gamma it's Nothing is terrible. Okay? Everything is just, uh, everything is like rolling out of bed. Right? So, okay, so, so far so good. And notice that we have now done the, the theories that in standard Lagrangian formalism are simple theories, no funny gauge symmetries and so on. We've done phi cube theory, we've done Yukawa theory. So now let's transition to where things get interesting. Let's imagine, we can, we're gonna do many examples, but just to sort of motivate everything, let us imagine that we want to deal with, uh, so our next example is we have a single, emphasize single, a single massless particle, they're all massless, of spin S, spin curly S, okay? And what is the three particle amplitude for this theory? Um, let's say we have this one, one minus, two minus, three plus, is some coupling constant, and as I said, it's 1, 2 cubed over 1, 3, 2, 3 to the power of s. And I won't write down the other one with the plus plus minus is just the, is just the conjugate of this, okay? Just flipping, flip, flipping the brackets. All right, now, the exciting thing about this amplitude, the weird thing about this amplitude is the presence of the pole in the amplitude. That is very weird, okay? That's very, very weird because uh, again, ordinarily, uh, we think about poles as signifying the production of particles, blah, blah, blah. Here it's just sitting there, and the three-particle amplitude has a pole sitting there already. Now, part of the reason we don't notice this and we don't talk about it in every quantum field theory course is what I mentioned already at the beginning of last time. This amplitude actually vanishes in Minkowski space. <laughs> okay? So when I take the limit where lambda is uh, the complex conjugate of lambda tilde, remember, in this configuration, the lambda tildes are parallel to each other. So uh, if I'm in Minkowski space, the lambdas also have to be parallel to each other. And so that means that all these brackets vanish. Uh, but there's more of them upstairs than downstairs, and so this whole amplitude is zero. Okay? But it is, it is peculiar that there are poles. Those poles and the standard way of doing things are associated with the existence of polarization vectors and all the rest of it. And this is something, again, uh, you could do it as a very nice project if you want to, uh, 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 if you want to look at this, someone wants to look at this for one of their papers is to really explicitly go through and compare the, uh, this spinner holistic formalism with standard polarization vectors and see how all this stuff works. But from our point of view, there's something a little peculiar about it, and it already makes us a little bit worried, which is the strategy that we just talked about for determining the four-particle amplitude may well have a problem now. What was our strategy, remember? We said, let's just work out what the poles are in ST and U, what the residues are in ST and U. We'll compute them and we get something. And then we make an ansatz for the full amplitude, which is just residue in S divided by S, plus residue in T over T, plus residue in U over U, right? And that would work if the residues are just polynomials. 
But the presence of the poles downstairs raises the specter of the possibility that the residues in the S channel might have a pole in the T channel or in some other channel. And then it's not so obvious that you can make it work. In fact, you might not be able to make it work at all. Okay, so that's why it's a little scary to have these poles downstairs in the three-particle amplitude. So let's actually see how it works. So let's look at the following amplitude. Let's look at, um, Sorry, yeah. Yeah, so in standard Lagrangian formalism, uh, you have polarization vectors. <laughs> and it's the presence of the polarization vectors that's, that, that's responsible for the, uh, for the poles. So uh, every way of writing the pole, you see, it, it's exactly the thing that if you want to see it as something that looks manifestly local, you'll, you introduce this polarization vector, and you have all this gauge redundancy. And in the on-shell configuration, uh, you can solve for the polarization vectors, and that polarization vector gives you the, uh, gives you the uh, poles. This fact that there are poles here is, is everything which is special about gauge theories, uh, uh, the, re the, the need for gauge invariance and, and, and general covariance for gravity and so on. It all comes already at this very primitive kinematic level. And I'll make a comment about it in a second. When we finish computing these amplitudes, we'll see in the cleanest way, in the four-particle amplitude, what the fingerprint is of why it's difficult to uh, uh, describe these theories in Lagrangian formalism. Um, it's not just some fact about using fields and redundancy and so on. It's a fact about what the amplitudes actually look like that tells you that there's a qualitative difference between these cases. We're going to get there in 15 minutes. Um, but first, let's just do the same exercise. Let's compute the residue in S. So I want to compute the residue in S for this scattering process. So I'm, I'm interested in the scattering process 1 minus 2 plus 3 minus 4 plus. And let's compute uh, the uh, residue in, in S, so from this sort of picture. Okay. And um, let me imagine that I'm in the configuration, that I've, I've, I've approached this residue in S by making, let's say, the lambda tildes of 1 and 2 parallel to each other. Okay, make the lambda tilde of 1 and 2 parallel to each other, and the lambdas on the other side parallel to each other. So that here what I have is, say, a minus helicity, and here I have a plus helicity. Okay? The same argument goes through in every other way that you could do it, but let's focus on, on this one. All right, so again, this is the intermediate line I, and let's work out what this, uh, what this residue is. So that's um, 1I cubed over 1, 2, 2i two to the power of the spin on one side. And on the other side, I have the other kind of bracket. So i4 cubed over i3, 4, 3 to the s. And now we're going to do exactly the same trick we've seen already in the previous case, that all sorts of formulas like you know, we'll, we'll use over and over again things like 1i, i4, for example, is equal to 1, 2, 2, 4, or is also equal to negative 1, 3, 3, 4, and so on. Okay? So if you do that, you can eliminate the i from these formulas, just like we did before. Okay? Now let me just write down what the, what the answer is. It's a, it's a very simple answer. We can actually just uh, just do it. So so let me just do it in the in one dumbest way, just so you see you don't have to be clever. So like let's say upstairs, I write it as I don't know one three cubed. So I'm going to use this one i i four. I'm going to replace i with three. Again, I'm not worrying about signs. So I have one three cubed, three four cubed upstairs, and uh, downstairs. Let me uh, uh, replace this two i i three with um, uh, yeah. I'm just making a random choice. So 1, 2. Um, uh, I'm going to replace i with 4 down here. So I'll get 3, 4, uh, 2, 4, 4, 3. Uh, no, sorry. Let, 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 me do, let me do it the other way. So I get one, let me put i equals two. So I have one, two, uh, no, uh, i equals three again, sorry. Two, three, 
Oh, what am I doing? Perhaps uh, the angle bracket should be one two, not one three. Um. Uh, sorry. Down here it's one two two i. Down here it's one two two i. Here it's i three four three, and so yeah. So here I can put. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Here I can put i equals one, for example. Sorry, I forgot. Here I have two i i three. So in here I could put i equals one. Sorry. So downstairs, I can put, I can replace i by one. So I have something like one two, uh, uh, one two, one two, and then two three, three four. Okay, and so you can see that this by by again the, the same the same tricks. This is one three squared, two four squared, divided by um, uh, one three. Angle one three one three, which is one three squared two four squared over u. Okay, so that's that's what's inside. That's what's inside. This is all raised to the power of s. So this is all raised to the power of s. Okay, so let's uh, so let's take take stock here. So the residue in the S channel is, now there's a factor that's 1, 3 squared, 2, 4 squared to the power of S. But then um, there's uh, something that looks like 1 over U to the S. Now this factor makes perfect sense. This just makes us you know, have the correct helicity weights for everybody. For 1, 2, 3, and 4, this just gives us the correct helicity weights for everyone. But now there's this thing as feared. Uh, from the presence of the poles in the three-particle amplitude, we can have a pole in the, uh, in the other variable. It goes like 1 over u to the s. Similarly, the residue in the t-channel is the same factor to the s, and it could be 1 over the s-channel to the power of the spin, and the residue in the u-channel, again, the same factor, 1 over t to the power of the spin. All right, so now we're in trouble. Right Now it's not so obvious how to build how to build a function which has the correct poles as st and u go to zero. I can't just trivially take these residues, plump them over s. To, I can't take rs over s plus rt over t plus ru over u, um, because if I do that, I'll have some things with many poles in the other channels. I have to check that they're all consistent. OK? So let's do it one at a time. And let's first deal with spin 1. Let's first deal with s equals 1. So let's say we have s equals 1. And so now the residue in the S channel looks like 1 over U. The residue in the T channel looks like 1 over S. OK? So, uh, yes? What if they're all multiplied um, 1 over U, 1 over S, and that's T? Sorry? If, if they're multiplied? Well, that, that's just, what we're, that's just what, we're, what, we're, what we're coming. We have to be careful. I'm just saying it's not, it's not automatic that it's going to work. OK? So, um, so but if, if S equals 1, the residue in the S channel is this factor, 1, 3 squared, 2, 4 squared, just 1 over U. And then similarly in P and U. So now, we have a chance for something to work, but what would the amplitude have to look like? The amplitude, would, uh, just on general grounds, uh, would have to look like, well, first there's this 1, 3 squared, 2, 4 squared. And then maybe I can have something A over SU. Okay. Okay, because the residue in the S channel looks like something like uh, 1 over U. So it'll look like, uh, let, me write it as, um, uh, let me write it as A over ST plus b over tu plus c over s over us. Okay, that's the most general thing I could imagine having okay, when, when, uh, when s equals 1. And again, naively this is, not, this, is not, uh, naively this is not good. But anyway, let's see what it takes. So um, uh, it could work if the residues are actually correct. So let me look at the residue, let's say, as s goes to 0. Okay, the residue as s goes to 0 is uh, interesting. Remember that, uh, I forgot if I said it before, but s plus t plus u is equal to 0 okay, for massless particles. So as s goes to 0, t actually becomes equal to negative u. So something slightly sneaky can happen here. Let me look at the residue as s goes to 0. See, from this formula, the residue as s goes to 0 is equal to well, there's something that looks like c over u from here, and then a over t from here. But t is equal to negative u as s goes to 0. 
So this residue is actually equal to C minus A over U. Good. So this has a chance. It seems to have naively have a chance, because this residue needs to actually equal 1 over U, or G squared over U. I've taken out the uh, uh, coupling constant. OK? So if I can choose A, B, and C, so that this formula, that so the residue works correctly in all the channels, then I'm in good shape. So can I do it? Well, unfortunately, I can't, because what does the formula I have to write down? I have From here, I have to have that C minus A is equal to 1. But I also have to have from the other two channels that A minus B is equal to 1 and B minus C is equal to 1. And these equations are inconsistent. Add them up, 0 equals 3. OK? So you see how non-trivial it is. It's not obvious that you can build a theory of a uh, self-consistent interacting massless spin 1 particle. In fact, we can't. For a single particle, we can't. OK? So let's keep going with spin 1. And say, OK, so we just proved there was no theory of a uh, self-consistent interacting massless spin 1 particle. Let's imagine there's many of them. There's many massless spin 1 particles. OK, so there's, there's another index for these amplitudes. There's 1, 2, 3. And let's say there's something I'll call A, B, and C. OK, there's many, many of these particles. So this three particle amplitude is exactly what we had before. It's 1, 2 cubed over 1, 3, 2, 3 with some g. So this is, again, 1 minus 2 minus 3 plus. But now there's many species, a, b, c. And I'm just going to give that part of it a name. I'm going to call it f, a, b, c. That's just a name. I've never heard of, uh, never heard of Yang Mills theory, nothing. I'm just giving it a name. OK? All right, everything is exactly the same. We haven't touched anything. The only thing that, that's going on is that these f's come along for the ride. So that now, when I have the residue in the s channel, now when I have the four particle amplitude, when I look at the residue in the s channel, there would be some a, b, and some intermediate e, some e, c, d. So this thing would have a factor F, A, B, E, F, E, C, D. On top of everything else that we did, right? So there would be a residue that would have a label, or, or let me call it, yeah, let me call it a little more symmetrically, A1, A2, A3, A4. There would be some F, A1, A2, E, F, A3, A4, E. Let's just call it like that, OK? And so the residue, now the amplitude would have these three labels, A1 through A4. And the residue in the S channel would be exactly the same computation that we did. OK, but now, now these, these things would, would have A1 through A4 indices on them, right? So, uh, so this would be C, A1, A2, A3, A4, minus A, A1, A2, A3, A4, over U which should equal f a1, a2, e, f a3, a4 over u. OK, so it's exactly the same as before our equations. But now c and a have these four indices on them. And instead of having these formulas c minus a equals 1, we have something decorated with four a's here with, with, the, with these indices. And on the right-hand side, we have f a1, a2, e, f e, a3, a4. And similar decoration for these other formulas. OK. So now, can we solve these equations? Yes, we can. What was our obstruction before? When you added all three equations, we got 3 equals 0 before. So we can solve these equations, provided that the right-hand sides add up to 0. That's the Jacobi identity. Okay. So that's how we discover we can have a consistent uh, theory of massless spin 1 particles, but only if these FABCs that we've attached to the amplitudes satisfy the, the Jacobi identity. All right, so that's pretty cool, right? So without anything about the beauty and wonder of local gauge invariance, blah, 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 uh, just pure consistency condition of uh, relativity and quantum mechanics forces that this is what the theory can uh, look like.
All right. We're summing over e, right? Yes, we're summing over e. Yes, it's summation convention for e. So we're summing, we're summing over, uh, almost always summing over repeated indices. Um, okay. So, so, so again, so we can have a consistent theory, if and only if f f plus f f plus f f equals zero. And not only have we determined that that's the uh, that that's a consistent condition, we've also computed the amplitude. <laughs> There's the answer, right? So we've both found the consistent theory as well as computed the amplitude in one go. That's pretty cool. Now a little exercise for you. Yes? No, no, you see, well, you, you, you'll, see, you'll see in a second. The reason it was not obvious it would work at all, you see, notice the, the whole reason I got the C minus A here is that different pieces uh, had... Uh, Hold your question for a minute because we're going to rule out all the other theories. Okay? Uh, all I'm saying is when there are no poles, this, uh, it's trivial to build a function that factorizes correctly. You just take the residue and you divide by s and you add the other channels. When there is a pole, it's not trivial. Okay? And, uh, okay. Now, let me make a little comment. This is a little exercise uh, for you. Um, uh, there's a very nice way, if you take the formula that, uh, that um, in general, let's say, Let's even just say for something you're familiar with, for UN, uh, that you can write uh, FABC. Well, FABC, that's just the definition of the, of the structure constants. You can also write FABC as the trace of TA commutator of TB and TC. And um, in this way, all of these formulas involving products of Fs uh, are actually traces, can be decomposed into traces of these Ts. Okay, so we'll maybe come back and talk about this in a little more uh, uh, detail later. But just for the moment, you can just do this exercise for fun uh, yourself. Um, we've written down the answer. You just solve for a, b, c by adding and subtracting these equations. So you know what a, b, and c are in terms of ff plus ff. Write all the f's like this. And then you'll write the final amplitude in the following very nice form that the amplitude for colors a1, a2, a3, a4 is uh, there's this sort of universal piece that's sitting there all the time, 1, 3 squared, 2, 4 squared. And then there are sort of three different channels. There's one channel that has poles in S and T, and what dresses that is the trace of TA1, TA2, TA3, TA4. There's another piece that looks like 1 over, let's say, TU, and what dresses that is the trace of TA1, TA3, TA2, TA4. And finally, there's the last piece, which is the trace of TA1, TA2, TA4, uh, sorry, TA1, TA3, uh, what am I doing? Oh uh, yeah, TA3, TA4, TA2, over S times U. So from the formulas that we just wrote down, and using that decomposition, uh, you can write it like this. Um, uh, I'm just saying this now. We, we'll do it in more, in more detail later. But uh, there's, a very, there's a very nice way of, of uh, associating each one of these um, pieces with each one of those traces. So if you imagine that these indices, 1, 2, 3, and 4, are sort of uh, cycled around so that the diagrams you draw are just planar. So you write down 1, 2, 3, 4 like this. See, if I don't allow the lines to cross, I could just draw this diagram, and I could also draw this diagram. But I can't draw the U-channel diagram, where they cross. OK? So this one, when the ordering of the particles around this, in this way, is 1, 2, 3, 4, which is the ordering I see here, TA1, TA2, TA3, TA4, the poles there are S and T. And similarly, this one. This would be the one where the particles are under 1, 3, 2, 4. So let's do 1, 3, 2, 4. Also 1, 3, 2, 4. And now you see what are the poles I'm allowed to see. I see P1 plus P3 squared, that's U. And P2 plus P3 squared, and this one, that's T. So that's 1 over TU. Okay. So this is a very nice thing that, uh, that you can take gluon amplitudes and break them into what's so-called different color uh, trace sectors. Okay? It's a sum over traces in different orderings. 
and each ordering only sees the poles um, that, that correspond to planar pictures with that ordering. Okay? So we don't see something, even though the full answer is permutation invariant, okay? uh, ordering by ordering, we don't see the full permutation symmetry, but we only see the poles that are compatible with the uh, planar diagrams. All right, but, but notice, regardless of how we write it, uh, a, a rather dramatic thing will come back and say, and, and emphasize this point again, the actual amplitude, this consistent amplitude that we've now found, this consistent amplitude cannot be written as a sum over two channels, S and T. S and T really appear as a product downstairs. <laughs> okay? And that is the, that's, the, that's the hallmark of the fact that if you want to try to describe it with a local Lagrangian, we can't do it. There is no way of doing it that it doesn't either break Lorentz invariance or introduce some kind of redundancy. <laughs> Okay? And it's not because we're not clever or smart enough. It's not because Weinberg said we have to introduce quantum fields and then we've got to go down this weird trajectory with redundancy and so on. It's just a damn fact about the amplitude. It doesn't look like a sum over channels. The channels are treated symmetrically. Now, if you're a string theorist, you've, this smells a lot like what you're familiar with in string theory, where the amplitude then also can't be uh, broken up into channels separately. And in fact, this, this, uh, this feature of Yang-Mills and gravity amplitude that we'll see in a second is sitting there already from massless particles, right? It's a, it's a hallmark of the fact that when we try to describe them uh, with local theories, we have to introduce redundancy. So let me say it yet another way. This is just the sharp statement. It is impossible to write this formula in a way that's something over S plus something over T when the numerator is Lorentz invariant. It's just built out of these objects. Just patently impossible. You can do it if you introduce some reference spinner. Okay, so you can expand, there is some way, and that's a nice exercise uh, to do, I'll put it on a problem set, there is some way to expand the numerator if you introduce some reference third spinner, eta, right? Then you can write it as something over S or something over T where the numerators have etas in them. That's fine. And if you're a Lagrangian lover, that's what you would compute in some light cone gauge uh, for, the, for, the, for the theory. Gauge fixing in some light cone gauge where indeed everything is fine, but it's not Lorentz invariant. Okay? Or if you want to see an expression only with poles, something in S and something in T, that's what we get from Lagrangians, but the numerators are these polarization vectors that are not well defined. So the S channel doesn't mean anything by itself. It's not gauge invariant by itself. The T channel doesn't mean anything by itself. It's not gauge invariant by itself. Okay, so these are all symptoms of the same underlying cause. Um, but this fact about the amplitude is the most invariant way of saying it. Okay? The actual amplitude cannot be split in a way that looks like a sum over distinct channels in a way that's, uh, that's compatible with either Lorentz invariance or, well, in this case, it's just uh, the only way to write it as a sum over different channels is to uh, break manifest Lorentz invariance. And then the kind of formula that you get is the sort of formula you're used to seeing in light cone gauge. All right. Now, um, so let's uh, keep, keep going. So that was for massless spin one. Uh, let's keep going a little bit. Um, uh, let's return to the single particle of spin two, massless spin two. Remember, for massless spin zero, we didn't have any problem, right? The amplitude was just one over S plus one over T plus one over U. So now let's return to our single massless particle. Now with the spin equal two, and now we're naively screwed, right? Because the residue in the S channel is now just one three squared, two, one three to the fourth, two four to the fourth over u squared. Now we're dead, right? There's a double pole sitting there. There's nothing I can do. Anything I do, I'd write down one over u squared s. Then I'm dead, right? There's a double pole sitting there in u. But not quite, because remember, this, is, this residue is valid when s goes to zero. And when s goes to zero, t is equal to, u is equal to minus t. So this formula is actually equivalently negative 1, 3 to the fourth, 2, 4 to the fourth over st. Again, it's only valid as s goes to zero, right? This is the residue in the s channel. And therefore, there is a single thing the answer can possibly be. If the answer can work, there's only one answer that it can be. Do you mean t? Huh? Oh, sorry, t u. I apologize. U t. So the only thing the, the amplitude could possibly be is 1, 3 to the fourth, 2, 4 to the fourth, the minus sign over STU. Okay? 
But now, of course, you can check. Of course, all the other residues work because this formula is symmetrical between SP and U. So we, magi we magically manage to make it work also for S equals 2. That minus sign is why gravity is attractive. <laughs> okay? So we've discovered there is a consistent theory of a massless spin 2 particle. And again, we've not only discovered that it's consistent, we've discovered the amplitude. Okay? Once again, just like in this other example with color, the magical thing, it cannot be split into the sum over st and u channels. There is this stu inextricably coming together in the uh, denominator. Okay, so we've found massless spin one. Now, let's say we do massless spin two, but we do many of them. You can repeat exactly the same exercise, now decorating these things with a1, a2, a3. You will find a formula very much like that Jacobi identity formula, but now it's slightly different. With, um, and you, you attempt to see whether those set of nonlinear equations that are not the Jacobi <laughs> relations, but something, another quadratic set of algebraic equations, do those set of equations have any non-trivial solutions? And you can remarkably prove the only non-trivial solutions correspond to non-interacting worlds. <laughs> Okay, they, 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 they correspond to just one set of spin, massless spin two particles that just talk to each other, another set that just talk to each other, another set that talk, just talk to each other. Of course, we can't rule that out, but there's no non-trivial interactions between them. So putting that trivial possibility of non-interacting worlds aside, we discover if a massless spin one, single one is impossible, multiple ones are possible, only when there's a Jacobi identity. For massless spin two, essentially only one is possible. And that's and the amplitude is the amplitude for general relativity. But you can have for, separate right. ones that interact with matter. Nope. Uh, now we're going to see that. Okay. Now, uh, so so th this was so far just the, the theories of just a, a particle of a single type interacting with itself. Okay. Any questions about this so far? Yeah. What about the pieces where there's no factorization and there's no force at all? Uh, well, the, so as it, as with our very first example, I could add contact terms all over the place here that I don't know what they are. Okay? And that corresponds in Lagrangian language to the fact that there might be other operators, higher dimension operators or whatever. But these are the things that are nailed on you and forced on you by the presence of these, of the lowest dimension couplings there are. I should have said that if you wanted to have uh, self-interacting part massless particles with the other kind of uh, amplitude, the all plus or the all minus, that's trivial. Those amplitudes didn't have any poles in them. Then you can do the exercise, you glue them together, you write down divided by S T U, and if you want to feel proud of having calculated some amplitude in the theory of the R-cube couplings or F-cube couplings, you will have done so. Okay? But though they're not the leading couplings. The leading couplings are these minus minus plus couplings, and those have these dangerous poles in them. Um, and that's why we see that, uh, uh, well, that, that's why we see what we saw. In fact, let's right away say, let's say you have a massless particle of spin 3 or higher. Now it's literally impossible. Now there's absolutely nothing we can do because there's a 1 over u cubed or higher sitting there. And nothing you can do can make that not a double pole. Okay? Even this thing, the u squared was the last thing that we could barely do because we can interpret u squared as ut. But the second the spin is higher than 2, it's impossible. So we learn from this simple algebraic quadratic condition that if you have a single spin s, self-interacting theories, Yang-Mills, gr, and nothing else. OK? Now, now let's keep going and ask for interactions of massless particles of spin s with other particles. So, so, so let's say we have a spin s particle. Now we have interaction with other particles. So let's say we have a, um, uh, let's say we have a particle of spin s coupled to uh, a photon, coupled to something of spin 1. OK? Now, this three particle amplitude, again, these are all just special cases of the general one. Um, but you can work out if this is, I'm just going to call it the photon, the uh, massless uh, spin one guy. Uh, so this is one, two. Uh, oh, sorry, let me, I'm, I'm doing this one, three. OK? Um, this is uh, one, two to the two s plus one, uh, two, three to the one minus two s and just 1, 3 to the minus 1. So again, to repeat, the, I have a photon, but I'm trying to couple a photon to other massless particles of general spin. And now let's look at Compton scattering. So the four particle amplitude involving two photons and two of these massless particles. Okay, so, so again, I want to look at an amplitude involving 
uh, let's say, 1 minus s photon, 2 plus photon, 3 minus, and this guy, 4 plus s. All right, now exactly the same computations, just gluing together these amplitudes. Um, uh, by precisely the same kind of calculations, um, rs is equal to 1 over u times uh, 1, 3, 2, 4 to the 2s. And then there's this interesting factor, 2 uh, of the sort that we saw before in the Yukawa case, but I'm writing this more symmetrical way, to the power of 2 minus 2s. Okay, I won't do the algebra in real time, but it's just you've seen it now a few times. We just if we glue things together, it's clear why there is danger. There's danger of things going downstairs. I think now now you see why why there is going to be danger doing that. And so we have something interesting here. Okay, so so that's the residue in the uh, S channel. And so you see something amusing that there is a qualitative difference when the spin of the particle that's coupled to the photon is bigger than 1 or less than or equal to 1. When it's less than, it, there's the 1 over u sitting there. We've seen that already. But on top of that, there's this other object that if it occurs downstairs, we're just dead. This is not s, t, or u. This is some weird old random pole. Okay, so this thing had better not appear downstairs. And that tells us that it's impossible to couple a particle of spin greater than or equal to 3 halves to a photon. If s is greater than or equal to 3 halves, if s is bigger than 1, this factor is negative, and so we're just dead as a doorknob because this thing is just a totally illegal, spurious pole that's not even allowed to be there of, of any sort. All right? So that's cool. We discover that uh, we can't have charged massless particles of spin greater than or equal to 3 halves. And in, indeed, that's consistent with everything that we know. We, are, we, we, we can have massless charged particles of spin 1, that's part of the Yang-Mills structure anyway, and we can have the lower uh, charged particles as well. Okay, good. Now, let's say there are many species. Let's say there are many species of everybody now. There's many species of these guys, and there's many species of those guys. Okay, so now on top of everything, um, now on top of everything in this amplitude, uh, in this uh, three particle amplitude, let's say I have an index um, uh, i and j and uh, a here for these guys. So on top of everything, there's going to be a factor which I'll just call t a i j. No idea there are generators or anything. I'm just giving them a name, t a i j. Okay. Okay. And now what you find is that when you compute the uh, See, it's exactly the same thing as, as happened uh, before. Before, when, when we had a single species, we had, this, we had this cancellation between the S and the U channels, right? But now the S channel is going to be proportional to something like TATB, the product of TATB. The, T cha the U channel will be associated with the product TBTA. So if TATB commuted with TBTA, everything is fine. If they don't commute, we're in trouble. And it does not obviously work. Okay, and in fact, you can just work out that, uh, that any residue looks like uh, 1, 3, 2, 4 to the uh, 2s, this factor that we just worried about that ruled out massless particles of spin 3 halves and higher, 2 minus 2s, times, let me call it a little r, and then the little r in the s channel is equal to ta i k t b k j right it's just what you get from summing over this index so there's an i and a k and a k and a j and an a and a b so this thing is t a i k on this side i get t b k j so i can think of this whole thing as the product of the matrices t a t b the i j entry okay so uh, uh, over u so this is T A T B over U. So let me uh, summarize again. So that's that's R in the U R in the S channel. R in the U channel is T B T A 
ij over um, uh, <clears throat> over s. And now, as I said, if TATB commutes with TB, if TATB equals TBTA, everything is fine. And we can put the channels uh, together just like we did before. If they don't commute, we're not fine. However, we're not completely dead because there's one final uh, channel that we could have. We could have a T-channel singularity. See, in this, in this scattering process, there is also, um, we know that those, those, uh, those spin one particles can have a self-interaction, FABC. So we can compute, if that FABC was there, we could compute this T-channel and the residue in the T channel, and I'm just choosing to write it in a way that's uh, uh, exactly the same little r sub t. Now on the T channel is 1 over s minus 1 over u times FABC TC ij. See, it's clear it's, it's that because here there's my ABC ij. Uh, sorry, FABD. Uh, sorry, C, and here's C here. So the, 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 the dependence on all these indices down here, there's a TCIJ. Up here, there's an FABC. OK, and so the full amplitude, so the only way that we could conceivably have a full amplitude is if it's equal to 1, 3, again, all these residue factors that we've just computed, this piece that killed the massless spin 3 have and higher. But I could have something that's one half TATB plus TBTA over SU plus FABC TCIJ uh, one over TS minus one over TU. But this works if and only if, obviously. So it's consistent. It factorizes uh, properly. It has the correct residue only if commutator of TA and TB IJ is FABC TC IJ. OK? So we see that not only do the self-couplings of the gluons uh, of these massless spin 1 particles have to be governed by something that satisfies the Jacobi relations, any other spin particle that couples to it. First, the spin can't be higher than three halves. And secondly, all the lower ones have got to have a coupling, which is exactly given by something in some representation of the Lie group. All right. Now, let's do exactly the same argument for massless spin two. Okay. So we couple things to massless spin two. And now, um, uh, let me just... Uh, let me, let me say it in words because you've seen it's, we're going to just write down exactly the same arguments over, over and uh, over again. So you do exactly the same thing and you take a, a, a particle of generic spin. Uh, you first do exactly the same first exercise and you have the analog of this, you have the analog of this factor, but instead of being 2 minus 2s, it's 4 minus 2s. All right? So the first thing you learn is that you cannot have particles of massless spin 5 halves or higher. Period. This is amazing. The mere presence of gravity, just the mere existence of gravity, makes it impossible to have particles of massless particles of spin five halves or higher. Okay. Yes. So that if you have gravity, sorry, if you have gravity. So, so if there's a theory with gravity, then you cannot have particles of massless spin five halves or higher. Right. Yeah, so, so here we're, we're, that's right. So, so if we want the consistent couplings to gravity. Then. Now, all of these things you can discover in the Lagrangian formalism in some more complicated way, but you just see it very vividly here just from this one simple algebraic problem. You see, there, we're solving one quadratic relation problem, right? We're trying to find amplitudes that factorize correctly on the poles, and uh, that's where all these consequences are uh, coming from. So first, you can't have particles of... Uh, uh, that two becomes a four, and you can't have particles of massless uh, uh, of spin five halves or higher. For the lower spin particles, you have exactly the same issue that that we have here. Let's say you give a random uh, particle of spin s, you give it some coupling to gravity, and you call the name of that coupling constant something. Cap uh, a random for a particle i, you give it you give it a name, gi. Okay. 
then what you'll find is that it's impossible for the amplitudes to factorize correctly. You'll have the same difficulty we found, the S channel and the U channel. They, they don't work. The only way it can work is, as we saw here, when you include the presence of the T channel. But on the T channel side, the coupling on the gravity, uh, on the pure gravity side is what we're going to define to be 1 over m Planck. That's what we're going to define to be the Newton constant or the square root of the Newton constant. Okay? So that's what tells you that the coupling of every other particle to mass of spin 2 must be universal. They all have exactly the same coupling. Okay? That's really the sort of analog of this statement now for massless, for the single particle of massless spin 2. Okay, so just four particle factorization tells you you can only have massless particles of spin less than or equal to two with universal couplings to this massless uh, spin one particle. And as I said, the case where the other particles of spin two is ruled out by the first, uh, by our earlier discussion. That if you have many massless spin two particles, you, you can show they have to live in different worlds. Okay, so, so, so what have we seen so far? We've seen that, uh, that um, if we have any particles, um, uh, first of all, if we have any photon, any gluon or photon, any massless particle of charge, any, any spin one particle forbids uh, the existence of um, particles of massless charged particles of spin greater than or equal to three halves. The presence of gravity implies the impossibility of massless particles of spin greater than or equal to five halves. So all the spins are now restricted to be between zero, one half, one, three halves, and two. Okay? The spin two is unique, that's gravity. The mass of spin one is unique, that's Yang Mills. We saw the spin zero and the spin a half, they can interact among themselves in these more boring ways like phi cube theory or Yukawa theory, right? Th that, that was the uninteresting stuff. But then the more interesting in interaction involving the mass of spin one and spin two have these constrained structures that we talked about. Last possibility that's not dead, uncharged massless particle of spin three halves. So far, this is not dead, right? In fact, as I said, the, the beauty of this is we've also written down all these amplitudes. So, I mean, you can go through exactly the same exercise and now find the consistent scattering amplitude. Not only find their consistent, but find the amplitude for massless particles of spin, any spin less than or equal to three halves coupled to gravity. But you can do it for massless spin three halves. Okay? So that's n equals one supergravity. And you actually see that, uh, that uh, supersymmetry, well, well, you don't yet see that it's supersymmetry, per se. You just see that the coupling of that spin 3 half particle is sort of universal, right? But it had to be. That, that's, that, that, that's fine. So we haven't really learned anything very interesting yet. So let me say the final thing that occurs when you have the particle of spin 3 halves. Okay, so let's say I have a massless particle of spin 3 halves. And now let me try to do... So it's perfectly consistent to have uh, S equals 2, 1 S equals 2 particle, uh, so that's the graviton, plus 1 s equals 3 halves. Okay? That's a perfectly consistent theory. So we even wrote down the amplitudes, everything is fine. But now let's say I take this theory and I try to add one more massless particle to it for fun. Why not? Let me take this theory and try to add to it a massless scalar, a massless spin zero particle. So I'm going to try to add to this plus a single spin zero particle phi. It seems innocent, but it's not that innocent because I can now talk about, for example, this scattering amplitude of two of the spin three halves guys uh, with two of these phi's. And because I have gravity around, there's inevitably a coupling there. Remember, the coupling of these guys to gravity is nailed and is universal, right? So there's one piece, there's an S channel, there's an S channel residue here just from graviton exchange. The coupling of gravity to these guys, I just told you, is universal. So I can't avoid this. And I can compute. Uh, so if this coupling is, is 1 over m Planck, as usual, I can compute. Um, and this, uh, uh, I, I, and as usual, the residue in the S channel will have a pole in the T channel. Just the bad thing that we've seen over and over again. OK? But now this is very bad, because what could possibly give me a pole in the T-channel? See, to get a pole in the T-channel, there has to be... So once again, uh, residue in S, residue in S, so Rs turns out to just be, uh, let's say, 3P1 minus 
P4, 4 cubed over T. OK? So there has to be a pole in the T channel. But with just this spectrum, what could I possibly have? Here is, here is the spin three, three half. Here is phi. I have to have something propagating there, some new thing propagating there in order to give me the residue in the T channel. So that's why I must have a massless fermion as well. So the spectrum has to be supersymmetric. If I had a massless scalar, I must also add a massless fermion. And that massless fermion is the partner of this massless scalar. Okay. Chi, let's call it. And the coupling, and this new coupling, has also got to be 1 over m Planck. So that's the coupling of the gravitino to the scalar and its superpartner. Okay, so that's the superpartner of the usual gravitational coupling. But again, from here we just see that not only do we, now we really have to do something new. We have to add a new kind of particle of the opposite statistics to make it work. Okay? So, so now we're building up the n equals 1 supergravity multiplets. And you actually, you can do this. If, if phi is a scalar, we're done. If phi is a spin 1 particle, you, you find all the different possibilities for the different kinds of multiplets that you can have. All right? And now this is a beautiful exercise that you can do, again, someone can do for one of their uh, projects, is to just keep on cranking up the number of massless spin 3 half particles. It's just an algebraic problem. You just keep on going. Do two of them. Okay? And then you discover if you do two of them, then the kind of matter you add is much more constrained. <laughs> you add three, four, five, more and more and more constrained. And then you'll discover it's impossible to do if you have more than eight of them. Okay? You cannot have more than eight massless spin 3 half particles. Again, this is just an algebraic problem. Just this little algebraic problem, that number 8 pops up out of this algebraic problem. And that's why we can't have more than n equals 8 supergravity in four dimensions. Okay? But all the different supergravities, the allowed spectra, and the couplings are just an answer to this little quadratic problem. The same quadratic problem that ruled out all the inconsistent theories, told us we had to have the yang mill structure, told us we had to have universal couplings with gravity, then also allows us the final possibility, the massless spin three halves with this supersymmetric spectrum and the supersymmetric particle content controlled uh, by supersymmetry in the appropriate way. Okay. Um, uh, very shortly, we're going to talk about how to do supersymmetry in a much more in a much more transparent and nice way in this uh, language. Um, but already at this very basic level, you know, you don't have to. Uh, ever stare at an n equals eight supergravity Lagrangian in your life? Okay, you don't have to sit and stare at these very complicated things, horrendous, complicated contractions of fermion, all these horrible fields. Um, not only can we discover the theories are consistent, we even write down the amplitude. And sorry, I forgot to say. So, what is the amplitude even for this for this uh, uh, simple theory of the scalar? The amplitude after we add the massless fermion is just that. <laughs> So we discover the theories that are consistent and the, and the consistent amplitudes at the same time. All right, that was meant to go a little quickly. Uh, there's a, a, lot of, uh, a lot of things for you to uh, fill in, both in the conceptual level at the very beginning with uh, why we're only allowed to have poles, not double poles, et cetera. Uh, various technical things about why when we sum over the intermediate line, the helicities are opposite on the other side. And so there are all these little things that you should go and think about yourself. But what I wanted to go in one go uh, through this algebraic problem, just so you see how much meat there is here, right? So that you really see that you begin in the most transparent, direct way, no veil, no formalism between the principles of relativity and quantum mechanics and the theories that we actually see describe the real world. Because that's the bottom line, almost from pure thought, starting from these principles of uh, relativity, quantum mechanics, locality, unitarity, we discover the only theories of massless, spin one part uh, of massless particles we can have are basically the ones that we know and love and we've seen, and there are no other choices. Right. OK, starting next time, we'll begin to be a little more irresponsible. Um, we'll try to calculate higher point amplitudes. And if you try to keep going with this very responsible, write down the answer, check that it factorizes, et cetera, it's too hard. You can do it in principle, but it's too hard. So we're going to start to be more adventurous and talk about BCFW recursion relations as a, uh, as a very effective way. So BCFW is a halfway point between responsibility and irresponsibility. <laughs> Um, it'll allow us to generate a huge amount of theoretical data um, from a reasonably responsible starting point. One magical thing happens, but after that, everything is more or less uh, responsible. And after we get BCFW under our belts, we'll start becoming really responsible. All right. OK, mm -hmm. thanks a lot. Yeah. Why can't that